150,000. That's how many drug tests Victoria Police will be conducting over the next year. That means drug testing more drivers in more places more often. It's across all Victoria. TAC, towards zero. The sun came up upon the left. Out of the sea came he. And he shone bright. And on the right went down into the sea. Waking up in the North Korean capital of Pyongyang sounds like this. Early most mornings, a synth-pop track called Where Are You, Dear General seeps out of speakers around the city as people head to work. It's said to be written by North Korea's former leader, Kim Jong-il, as a younger man. He's the father of North Korea's present leader, Kim Jong-un, Just hearing it and knowing that it's played around the capital six days a week is a reminder that life's different in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. To understand the world in which the men aboard the Pongsu grew up, we need to briefly get our heads around how North Korea came to be. North Korea was formed at the end of the Second World War in 1945. The defeat of Japan ended its brutal 35-year occupation of the Korean peninsula. This fellow is a typical example of the native Korean. He bows to the dominion of Japan, but he firmly declines to admit the superiority of Japan's intellectual and moral culture over his own. Korea was split into two on the 38th parallel. The South was under American control. The Soviets ran things in the North, and installed communist soldier Kim Il-sung as leader. In 1950, the Korean War began. In Korea, United Nations troops push on in the cautious advance against the communists. An advance whose purpose, General Ridgway states, is not to seize ground, but to wipe out the enemy. It ended in a stalemate three years later, having cost millions of lives. A four-kilometre-wide demilitarised zone was created to divide the two careers, and Kim Il-sung's leadership evolved into a personality cult that portrayed him and his descendants as religious deities. As decades passed, North Korea has continued to withdraw from the rest of the world and to build up its military at the expense of ordinary people. The country was hit hard by the collapse of the Soviet Empire in 1991. The Soviet Union has been on the minds of many Soviets for many weeks. It is widely believed that the head of the KGB, the defence minister, the minister of the interior, the prime minister, plus Mr Gorbachev's own vice president, have been planning the coup for weeks, if not months. But the Kim regime prevailed, with leadership passing from Kim Il-sung to his son, Kim Jong-il, and on to today's leader, grandson, Kim Jong-un. It remains a repressive, dangerous and unpredictable place. Last episode, we heard about the night the North Korean cargo ship, the Pong Su, was tossed in wild seas off the Victorian coast, while two men tried to bring 150 kilograms of heroin ashore in a high-risk operation that left one dead and the other hiding out in the hills. <laughs> And how the police first got involved after a tip-off. There was a guy acting suspiciously at the Crown Casino complex, so that's where we picked him up. So this was Teng. The picturesque coastal town of Lawn had never seen anything like it. 80 federal cops, just, there's coppers just everywhere. I'm just going, what the fuck's going on here? This episode, we're going back to the start of the Pongsu's journey and learning about the characters and their life on board. In 
In late February 2003, the master of the Pong Su, Song Man Sun, ran his final engine checks and counted 30 crew, including himself, before powering out from the North Korean port of Nampo for the last time. The North Korea they were leaving behind was headed by Kim Jong-il, who was creating immense global tension with his nuclear weapons program. North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction while starving its citizens. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil arming to threaten the peace of the world. I will not stand by as peril draws closer and closer. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. At home, Kim Jong-il inflicted forced labour and arbitrary execution on his people. But in the West, weirdly, he became known for his big quiff of hair, huge black glasses and his love of Hennessy cognac and Hollywood movies. A caricature of him even had a starring role in one American film. What, you think I'm just a petty arms dealer? I'm planning the attack! Congratulations, Team America! You have stopped nothing. But he was no joke to his people or to the men on the Pong Su. His portrait, and that of his father, North Korea's founding leader, Kim Il-sung, hung in almost every room on the ship. At 64, the skipper of the Pong Su, Master Sun, was close to a well-earned retirement. This short, stocky man with his impressive head of hair was looking forward to spending time with his grandchildren. There were more than 20 of them. He just had to complete this last job, one which would take him and his ship further than they'd ever been. Master Sun was deeply admired by the men who sailed under him. Though there was a clear hierarchy on the Pong Su, the 30 crew aboard her shared at least one thing in common, a recognition that their jobs were among the best in North Korea. These are people who have a chance to literally travel the world, right? So they've been to Singapore, they've held US dollars, they've earned hard currency, they've spent it, you know, they've uh, probably met people uh, in ports. Uh, so they, they have a very, very different life experience to most North Koreans. Jaco Zvaltslut is a lawyer and broadcaster with a fascination for North Korea. He's originally from Melbourne. From the South Korean capital of Seoul, he runs a website called NK News, which has its own podcast. He's been to North Korea three times, and he got to know Master Sun and the Pong Su crew. And I imagine it would be quite a, a sought-after job for North Koreans. You know, this is a chance to, to get out and to earn hard currency, something that the, the families back home can use, uh, and to, to see a bit of the world. An average crew member could make as much as 500 US dollars a month. In North Korea, crews on ships that travelled abroad usually had family at home. This was viewed by their superiors as insurance against defection. Another reason why work on the Pong Su was in such high demand was the food. Hundreds of thousands of North Koreans, possibly many more, starved to death in a famine in the mid-1990s. Food shortages are still common today. By contrast, the Pong Su offered a smorgasbord. Here's a provisions list from the Pong Su's larders. Two and a half kilos of red snapper Three fish. kilos of mackerel. Two kilos of chilos you know, of frank Eight kilos sausages, of large prawns. Five kilos four kilos of tenderloin pork beef, belly. Eight kilos of streaky bacon. Coca-Cola. Ten kilos enough. of salami. Can't travel. Can't you know, travel. One, one village to one village, you know, need a permission. Yeah. But, uh, That's Noah Park, you know, you know, a Korean-Australian, talking about how hard it is for people to move around in North Korea. Like Jacko, Noah grew fond of Master Sun and the Pong Su crew. He too has been to North Korea. And, as a former seaman himself, 
He knows being on the Pong Su gave the crew freedoms and opportunities the rest of their countrymen could only dream about. They can private uh, uh, illegal imports goods and import things that, mm. and when you go to overseas to the ship, they buying to some uh, TV and computers buying that. That is one of the Bongsu ship. Then they have a uh, they got the money. They buy some medicine or bicycle, some uh, computer and. Noah's life has always been linked to the ocean one way or another. Born in South Korea, he started out working on freight ships around Asia. Then he studied to become a chaplain in the Mission to Seafarers. That's a Christian charity that provides accommodation and comfort to mariners the world over. Noah's been based at the Geelong Mission for about 15 years. Geelong's Victoria's second biggest city, an hour's drive from the state's capital, Melbourne. It was in this role as chaplain that Noah got to know the North Koreans from the Pong Su. We'll hear more about that later. Though he hasn't seen Master Sun for a long time, he still thinks about it. Yeah, he's a captain. Usually we talk, he's 60, over 60 years old. So he he likes to, I'm going home, Dad, he's going to and 60 year celebrations with the families. I need a, need a, need a fun, you know. Can you help me do some fun? <laughs> <laughs> so go celebration in, in North Korea that time. Yeah. Yeah. He's thinking, you know, some retirement for, for that. Yeah. Noah says Master Sun was a humble person. He also says he never asked the captain about the drugs. Oh, then I didn't ask him that because they ever, you know, private things, we only part of, you know, helping them, you know. Mm. That business, your business, then, you know. But he did acknowledge that making a trip as far away as Australia was out of the ordinary. We don't know how the distance between North Korea and Australia is 7,320 kilometres as the crow flies. North Korean, it's very unusual, you know, long trip to go, you know. So, yeah, very dangerous, that. But it's, they travelling far away to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> it was a long, long, long journey. journey yeah. Despite enjoying the freedoms of life on board the Pong Su, it would be wrong to think that this caused the men to question the regime they'd been raised under back in North Korea. Far from it. But even if they had been tempted by what the wider world had to offer, they'd have been hard-pressed to escape. The system travelled with them. All of communist parties today have a job to do, you know. They mm. have also control to the, see the people. On the Pong Su, the job of keeping an eye on the crew belonged to a man called Choi Dong Song. We're going to refer to him as political secretary Choi. Well presented, balding and nearly 60, Choi started out as a tractor driver. He joined the Pong Su in the year 2000. He knew little about seafaring, but he knew a lot about the ways of the Korean Workers' Party, North Korea's only political party. Actually, they system, and nearly five people that one of them, one of them is a nearly connection with the Communist Party. So he's one. Noah's of them. telling me about the cell of five Korean Workers' Party members on board the Pong Su. As political secretary. Choi was the most senior cell member. Master Sun was also a member. On the ship, it was his word as skipper, not the political secretaries, that carried the most weight. Uh, really, you know, suspicious to each other. Yeah. <laughs> that is, you know. Everyone watching. Yeah, on yeah, other. watching on that. So Officially, Choi's job was to ensure discipline and adherence to the Workers' Party doctrine. He'd hear confessions from the crew who all harboured aspirations to one day be given the honour of party membership. But Australian authorities believe Choi's role went well beyond dispensing discipline. With a rare cabin of his own, he kept studious notes about events and people on board. Can you describe what the ship was like? Well, the Pongsu is a typical logger. Uh, Japan built a lot of those type of ships. 
Basically built John Millward is a sea captain with decades of experience. He's a lecturer at Australia's Maritime College in Hobart in Tasmania. He's inspected every inch of the Pong Su. By that I mean she was designed for carrying logs and timber. Uh, she wasn't designed as a, as a, a general cargo ship. Although she could... Built in 1980 in Japan, the Pong Su was 106 metres long and her displacement weight, that's the weight of a ship based on how much water it displaces, was 4,480 tonnes. She had a cargo capacity of 8,346 cubic metres. She communicated mostly via Morse code and shortwave radio. Fax messages could be received via a machine known as Inmarsat. She was the flagship of the Pongsu Shipping Company of Pyongyang. Not much is known about the Pongsu's owner, but its North Korean directors claimed it was a privately owned company and not a government entity. The company had five other ships. And yes, I know what you're thinking. How come there's a commercial shipping outfit in a bastion of communism? No one's been able to explain that to me either. Although the crew worked hard to keep the Pong Su looking fresh with coats of paint, beneath the surface, she was barely holding together. At best, she had another 10 years in her. Well, she was an old ship. Uh, she wasn't in pristine condition by any means. Uh, but interestingly enough, she had been modified. One modification was because she didn't have the range to reach Australia from North Korea. So they had actually modified her with extra fuel tanks. Captain Millwood noticed some other things as well like a secret yeah, compartment. A they just built a false bulkhead into the lower accommodation deck. And of course, the other thing was that at launch, she'd used a, an inflatable boat. And of course, those ships are not fitted with inflatable boats, and there's no use for them in that type of vessel. So uh, the, the extra fuel tanks, the, the false bulkhead, and knowing that she had on deck an inflatable boat, well, it was, certainly convinced me that, uh, that she was on a special voyage for a special purpose. Special purpose or not, there's a lot of downtime at sea. And the Pong Su was not built for comfort. Her cabins were small and mostly shared between two. She had narrow iron stairs and dark corridors. Still, for the hardened men aboard, she kept them safe and dry. For entertainment, the men watched DVDs, read, smoked and drank a bit and sang karaoke. While Master Sun and Political Secretary Choi were the most important men on board, they weren't the only interesting ones. Two much younger men who could speak and write in English were on their first trip with the Pong Su. They'd both play a special part in the dramatic final days of the Pong Su voyage. A word from our sponsor. 150,000. That's how many drug tests Victoria Police will be conducting over the next year. That means drug testing more drivers in more places more often. It's across all Victoria. TAC towards zero. The Pong Su's last journey started out ordinarily enough. She left Nampo and travelled across the Yellow Sea to China for some repairs, and then on to the Chinese port of Yantai. Here, she took on a load of feldspar, a raw mineral used to make glass and ceramics. The Pong Su then traced back towards North Korea for no apparent reason. She anchored at a place called Jia Mei Do, commonly referred to as Sister Island. Sister Island is not a recognised port. It's not far from the Pong Su's home port of Nampo. It's most likely here that two special passengers boarded. Ta Sa Wong, the man we left hiding in the hills at Boggley Creek on the Great Ocean Road, and his compatriot, 
a five foot six inch tall middle-aged man, unaware that he had less than three weeks to live. And with them came something far more valuable than a load of feldspar, six bags of heroin worth more than $100 million. It should, I know should should called in Southeast Asia on the way down. Yeah. Captain Millwood has had access to the Pongsu's logbooks and charts and has plotted her journey from North Korea. From Sister Island, the Pongsu steamed towards Singapore, passing close to Taiwan on the way. There was nothing unusual about this part of the journey, except for the Pongsu's crew number increasing from 30 to 32. Master Sun reported 32 crew to maritime authorities in Taiwan and Indonesia. The master even made a note about needing extra pocket money for the new arrivals. Anchored off Singapore, the Pong Su took on fuel in its specially made tanks. Master Sun set course for the Indonesian capital of Jakarta. Here, they unloaded the feldspar, and the crew went ashore for some downtime. Master Sun went shopping. He was keen to find some dresses for his granddaughters on this, his final voyage, and possibly the last time he'd ever be able to leave North Korea. By the time the Pong Su had entered Australian waters, she had undergone a subtle but important change. Let's say if you brought a ship into Australia under a, a North Korean flag, people would start asking a few questions, where if you brought it in under, under a Tuvaluan flag, you wouldn't be asking quite so many questions. Captain Millwood is describing how the Pong Su came to be flying the flag of the tiny Pacific nation of Tuvalu. Tuvalu makes money from providing what's called a flag of convenience to shipping companies. And the Pongsu's owners wanted the ship to be recognised as Tuvaluan for the next three months. It cost the Pongsu's owners over 12,000 US dollars to make the change. Basically, a flag of convenience is what we call an open registry. So anybody can, in, can put a ship under an open register. Uh, Singapore, for instance, is an open register. Compared with a, a closed register, which the Australian flag is, the Australian flag, you, know, you have to be an Australian company to register a ship under an Australian flag. The name of the Pong Su's home port of Nampo was removed from the ship's stern. It was replaced by a freshly painted sign, Funafati, the capital of Tuvalu. It wasn't the only strange thing to happen as she came closer to Australia. Uh, she suddenly left the, the normal shipping lanes, and particularly when she went round the bottom of Western Australia, she definitely went out of her way to keep out her shipping lanes, so she couldn't be sighted, obviously. She the Pong Su's charts told Captain Millwood that some really odd things started happening with the direction of the ship as it wound its way down Western Australia's Indian Ocean coastline. Near the West Australian town of Geraldton, the Pong Su came perilously close to shoals. Master Sun would have seen the dangerous shallows marked on his maps and known that they had the potential to sink his ship. But he took the risk anyway, to allow access to Australia's mobile phone network. Phone records show calls between a mobile phone used by Wong on board the ship and one used by one of the men waiting at Boggley Creek, the man called Lam. Yeah, 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 but he said to me, he said to me, what is the situation? As the Pong Su steamed towards Australia, she received some fax messages from her owner's head office in North Korea. They purported to be instructions from a supposed charterer in Malaysia called Kimto. The faxes said Kimto wanted the Pong Su to load some BMWs in Melbourne. But the Pong Su never contacted the port of Melbourne to arrange any pickup. Anyway, the Pong Su would have had a hard time carrying BMWs, or any cars at all. Well, you don't put cars on ships like that. Um, it's, she's not a suitable car carrier. I wouldn't say you can't put cars on it, but in fact it's very, <laughs> very unusual. And, and certainly if you were picking up pristine cars after a motor show, you wouldn't be putting them on a, on a logger. you would be asking for trouble.
Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Sydney where the local time is 2.46. They actually arrived on the same flight from Beijing. They arrived together. Celeste Johnston was the federal police case officer for the Pong Su job. She's a detective sergeant in organised crime for the AFP. Being case officer for the Pong Su job meant she had to be across every detail. She worked closely with her boss, Des Appleby, who we heard from last episode. Celeste says two of the three-man shore party who were waiting to take hold of the heroin at Boggley Creek came to Australia on the same plane, but they sat apart. One was Kiam Fa Teng. He's the little guy who Des told us last time was raising eyebrows at the casino. We'll just call him Teng. The other man was Yao Kim Lam, or at least that's what his passport said. Lam was the guy who called Wong on board the Pong Su as it rounded Western Australia, and who would be later overheard shouting frantically on the listening device. No one is dead, you know? Teng wasn't important enough to have a fake passport. He came under his own name. Years later, this may prove to have been a blessing in disguise. These little fish didn't know it yet, but they'd appeared on the radar of some very big operators. Our relationship with the DEA, both in Australia and offshore, is very, very close. We do work very, very closely with them. We do have a lot of jobs that do converge with each other and we do uh, a lot of liaison with the DEA, both here and and offshore. Um, One of the things that has intrigued me about the Pong Su case is how did the Australian Federal Police know that something big was brewing and that Teng was involved? That's never really been explained. My hunch is that the tip came from the American Drug Enforcement Administration, or the DEA. You know, the narcos guys on Netflix who caught Pablo Escobar. I'm Steve Murphy, drug enforcement agent. This is my partner, Javier Pena. So I put it to Celeste. Look, as I said, our relationship is very, very good, and they're so well-placed in, you know, dozens and dozens of countries. So we do. We do rely on them. Yeah. And a lot of intel does come via their sources and, and their, their means, but... Um, Not always. No. While I couldn't pin down Celeste on whether the DEA was directly involved with the Pong Su, the notebooks of Australian Federal Police agents disclosed in court refer to DEA briefings soon after the Boggley Creek importation. Anyway, back to Teng and Lam. It didn't take long for them to travel from Sydney to Melbourne and to check into rooms at the Crown Casino. Melbourne's Crown Casino is massive. It takes up the equivalent of two city blocks on the south bank of the city's Yarra River. It's a mecca for Asian tourists and high rollers. It's also one of the state of Victoria's biggest employers. Crown has been in the news for all the wrong reasons this year. An exclusive investigation has revealed how business operations by Crown Casino were designed to lure high-roller Chinese gamblers to Australia. Several persons of interest to police from China... There are calls for a parliamentary inquiry into Crown Resorts after 60 Minutes aired allegations of its links to organised crime and money laundering. It's possible some of the money launderers being investigated now a link to the syndicate members who helped arrange the Pong Su's heroin. But Des maintains Crown worked closely with Australian law enforcement in the Pong Su case. Crown security reported to Des that Tang and Lam had booked several rooms at Crown. But that was all the police had to go on. Now it was time to watch and wait for something to happen. Loud and clear, Nance. And uh, our man's on Lonsdale Street, northern side. He's just popped out of Melbourne Central and he's standing uh, near the crossing smoking a cigarette and a paper under his left arm. Oh, yeah, that's near the corner of um, Pongsu. Made about 100 metres uh, west. So we had Teng and Teng getting around, so he became the focus. So we put surveillance on an envelope around him to try and work out what he was up to. That was Des Appleby, the police boss of the Pongsu investigation. Celeste says tailing people chews up a lot of police resources. So the monitoring requires constant surveillance, consistent follow-up inquiries based on, on their activities. Sometimes surveillance, hours and hours of it, 
can yield nothing. Tang and Lamb spent a lot of time driving around Victoria's spectacular Great Ocean Road coastline. They stopped at a few piers and jetties and could easily have been mistaken for tourists keen on fishing. They also did some shopping. Lamb bought a Canon digital camera and binoculars. But unlike most tourists, Lamb also carried a global positioning system or a GPS device everywhere he went. Celeste, Des and their team got a break when Tang arrived in Geelong in search of a rental car. The police managed to get a hidden camera in the rental office to record Teng's conversation with the store manager. Yeah. And um, now, you got an, another, you got an address yet so I can cook for the insurance, or are you still at the sundown of those? Yeah, that's that. Teng couldn't decide between a Toyota Tarago and a Mitsubishi Pajero four-wheel drive. Uh, I still think you're better off with this one if you no, mate, Eventually, Teng settled on the Tarago van. This hire car presented the police with a golden opportunity. And when we broke into their car and installed the listening device, I had a look in there. They had fishing rods, they had stuff like that. It's a game of cat and mouse. So we're trying to do things where they're not around and we've got ways and means to, to do what we do. I won't tell you listeners exactly what we do um, because no other police in Australia would enjoy that, but we, we try not to get caught doing what we're doing. We leave that to their imagination of what we do. Bring that over. I was so lucky I wasn't busted. I put it inside. I'm so lucky they didn't find it. By accident or design, Lee was on the radar of Australian authorities as soon as he arrived. They pretty much searched through my entire briefcase. I didn't get rid of the dirty stuff yet. The listening device installed in the Tarago picked him up telling Tang how his belongings had been searched on his way in at Sydney Airport. It's so lucky they didn't get the licence. Lee was surprised immigration officers failed to notice that he was carrying something suspicious and very useful, a fake driver's licence. Everything else was given to them. They took it all for photocopying. Luckily, they didn't photocopy that licence. Anyway, now that he was here, Lee was sticking close to Teng. By watching the pair, the police learned something important about Lee. So we didn't actually know Lee's name for a while, but we do watch you know, the body language. So when we watch him under surveillance, it's, uh, it's Lee waving the finger at, at Teng. He's giving advice to Teng on how to do things. He's the one sitting in the car as, as, and Teng's driving. And, and he's the one sort of driving the discussion about what to do, how to do it, what to do when police. So it became quite apparent to us he was someone very experienced at this sort of activity. Lee told Teng as much during one of their many drives in the Tarago. People need to cooperate. For such a big trade, you have to find people you can work with. If they don't cooperate, it's hard to get anything done. I'm telling you, I have been in this industry for a long time. And let me tell you, I know who's the boss behind the scenes, but it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Everything was falling into place. The three shore party members, Teng, Lam and Lee, were under surveillance. The police had progressed from having a mere tip-off to something that was now looking as if it might be massive. Still churning, still unknown and undetected, through the Great Australian Bight in the Southern Ocean was the final moving part in this story. Pong Su, with Master Sun at the helm for the last time, and two special passengers, Wong and his friend. And of course, more than $100 million worth of heroin. In the days to come, Master Sun would display skills that could only be learned from a life's work on the ocean. The way the ship was being handled uh, in that little bay was absolutely remarkable. It was a very dangerous exercise. And the way the master was handling the ship, I saw that video and I said, well, that's not the first time the master's done that. He knew exactly what he was doing.
Next time on The Last Voyage of the Pong Su. These guys from a rental company, can they plant that kind of thing to this on us? Do you know how serious that is? It's something only the FBI can do. This was not going to be the end of it. This was supposed to be the trial run for further imports using that same methodology. It looked like they were going to spend the night there. So we were going to go out to a restaurant and have a nice meal and we were just getting ready and uh, next thing you know it was standby, standby from our surveillance and uh, they're on the move. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is brought to you by the newsrooms of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. To read more and to watch the videos referenced in this episode, head to our websites. While you're there, why not take out a subscription to help power independent Australian journalism and productions like this podcast. If you're enjoying this series, leave a review on iTunes and recommend us to a friend. The Last Voyage of the Pong Su is reported by Richard Baker. Field recording and audio editing by executive producer Rachel Dexter. Narrative consultant is Kate Cole Adams. Siobhan McHugh is consulting producer. Music and composition by Vicky Hansen. Sound design and mixing by John Greenfield. And Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Thanks to our cast of actors. Chi Kwan Lee is played by Andy Song. Kyum Fa Teng is played by Anthony Ting. And Yao Kim Lam is played by Jason Chong. Casting by Catapult Casting. Script translations by Yan Zhuang. Additional film audio from Narcos Productions, LLC. And MMDP, Munich Movie Development and Production. The reading you heard at the start of this episode was an excerpt from The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, read by Jason Chong. 